Okay. Katie, did you get a picture of it? Yeah, no, Give me the microphone. Give me the microphone. Yeah, he needs the mic. Yeah. One more time. Okay. 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 Microphone that does not like me. Oh, you like it? You ask for it all the time. <laughs> She's going to kill me. Uh, absolutely kill me. Put it right here. Uh, I know this isn't about Jack and Jane. It's about the Wyoming Ham Con and this wonderful, wonderful convention and all the people that put it together. Uh, she is the love of my life. My soulmate. My best friend. And I love you dearly. She's like that part, I'm sure. We, we are taking our entire family, uh, all our grandkids and spouses and sons to uh, Vegas for the 4th of July week. And she, we went through the wonderful shop across the parking lot uh, yesterday and she cornered me and she says, we have a deal. And she said, no gifts. Our gift is the trip to Vegas. Oh, really? And I went like this. Yes, dear. I promise. I promise. I promise there will be no gifts. Well, she knows me better than that, I think.
Connecticut, and that's when I first met Sean almost 10 years ago, and I was already working there, and when he walked through the door, and um, we had our first conversation, it was like we were long lost brother and sister, and it was like that from there on. We spent, we both lived in apartments, and wanted to be able to get on the air, and we worked together with Ed Hare, W1RFI, who provided some funds, and we actually renovated the um, staff club station at ARL headquarters so that we could get on the air and play. And so we spent a great deal of time, you know, during lunch, after hours, weekends, contests, just playing radio and, and having a lot of fun. And he taught me so many things that I know about ham radio and, and is doing it again right now with, with satellites. He, you know, showed up at the house with um, all kinds of things to teach me. but. Um, you know, as many of you may or may not realize, the wonderful event that just finished up, the National Parks on the Air, that was his baby, that was his idea that came to fruition through the hard work of himself and many of his fellow staffers at headquarters. I'm not going to read you his bio, you can go to QRZ.com and read all about him, go on YouTube and watch his videos, you can go check out the Spurious Emissions, which is the band that plays on Friday night at Hamvention, which is a lot of fun and roped me into it a couple of times, but... Um, Sean has a lot of diverse hobbies and is a lot of fun. He's a musician, he's a pizza maker, he's a baker, he has a cool cat, and, <laughs> and, uh, and somewhere along the way he's also the ARL public relations and media manager for, for our wonderful organization that keeps us going. And he's a very good friend of mine, probably one of my best, and I'm really happy that we roped him into coming out here to Wyoming again tonight. And so with that, I would like to... Hear what he has to share with us tonight. So please help me welcome Sean Cupsco, KX9. Stand up, Sean. <laughs> Variation. Variation on a theme. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Yeah, we'll see. Um, thank you, Katie, Dwayne. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, the convention this weekend. This is my second time in Wyoming, and uh, I seem to be uh, having a tradition now. Uh, every time I come to Wyoming, I seem to get a bug. So uh, I apologize for my froggy throat, but uh, we'll see what we'll see what we can do tonight. Um, it's wonderful to see so many people who enjoy amateur radio gathered here uh, in the room tonight. Uh, every single one of us who is licensed has a story to tell about how we got interested in all of this. Uh, I owe a great deal of credit to my interest in amateur radio to my mother. Uh, when I was a very young child, I kept her awake all night and drove her absolutely bananas. And she went out and got me an AM FM clock radio and tuned it to the local classical music station where I grew up at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. And uh, her, her, her goal was to let me listen to classical music at night so that I would be wafted away to sleep or something like that. And uh, when I was about three, I discovered the AM portion of the radio and started tuning around. And uh, one morning I came out and asked her where Boston was. And 
she went out that day and got a map and put it next to the radio, and I owe her a great deal for that. So um, we all have our uh, we all have our ways that we got interested in amateur radio. I got started through um, broadcast band DXing, shortwave listening. Uh, I was about eight when I got a CB, and uh, I came in that way. And then I finally got licensed in uh, 1982 through the good graces of the University of Illinois Amateur Radio Club for the students there. Uh, Sinton Amateur Radio Club W9YH and uh, I owe them a great deal for uh, putting up with uh, a 14 year old kid who got into the club because his mom worked at the university and we were granted the same access as all of the students so I owe them a lot for that um, my interests in amateur radio have changed over the years. You know, 1982 was 35 years ago, and I'm sure that uh, all of us have gone through similar changes in the hobby. You know, I, when I first got interested in amateur radio, my interest was DX. You know, I wanted to see who I could talk to, how far away they were. Uh, that was all that I wanted to do. You know, I uh, somehow managed to graduate college by. Uh, at the same time skipping a whole lot of classes because that was the summer of 1989-1990 and the solar peak was fantastic that year and I stayed home a lot working DX on 10 meters uh, but still managed to get a degree out of all of that so that you know I got started in DXing then I got started in contesting on the HF bands around the early to mid 90s I got introduced to 6 meters and VHF operating and got hooked on grid squares and I kept trying to build and build a bigger and better station as best as I could, you know, get a 30-foot tower and a tri-band Yagi, you know, and then get a 50-foot tower and a bigger Yagi, and uh, kept working and working and building on that. And then, uh, you know, the whole notion of being able to go out and go portable and, and transmit from some of these locations became very appealing. Somewhere back in the mid-1990s, I actually wrote Wayne Mills and asked him, how do I do all of this stuff? And he sent me a copy of his self-published book on uh, de-expeditioning basics. And uh, I learned a lot from that book, Wayne. Thank you for sending that to me. So, that was all fine and dandy, and I kept working on bigger and better stations until in the early 2000s, I found myself with a 70-foot tower in the middle of a farm in rural Illinois, loaded to the gills with antennas, and I got divorced. <laughs> but I've been living in an apartment ever since. <laughs> Not too many apartments let you put up an antenna with a big tower like that. So uh, I had to change. And uh, I got very interested in uh, low power operating, QRP operating, portable operating, uh, making do with less. And uh, that is uh, something that uh, has stayed with me to this day. Um, that was a real paradigm shift for me. You know, I had to accept that change. And uh, I loved ham radio so much, I wasn't going to let that change keep me off the air. So how can we change? Um, you know, now I'm doing a lot of work with satellites. And uh, in the steps of the people who taught me at the University of Illinois Club, and people like Wayne Mills, who taught me the secrets of working DX and contesting and all of that, I learned a lot from those gentleman when I was an up-and-coming ham. And now that I am, I've been licensed for 30, 35 years, it's my turn to teach. And that's how this works. Everybody, every single one of us in this room had somebody teach us how amateur radio works, whatever our interest in the hobby is. And now that we are older and established, it's our turn to teach others how to do this. Elmering and mentoring is extremely important to the lifeblood of this hobby. So, if you are an Elmer or a mentor, I thank you very much for what you do for Amateur Radio. But there's always change, right? Amateur Radio has always been about change, you know, with, uh, from Spark to CW, uh, bringing an AM, sideband, tube technology to transistors, solid state. There's always change. And there's always controversy that comes with that change. And... You know, we're going through a similar period with some of that now, with uh, new introductions of digital modes in the hobby. A lot of experimentation with microcontrollers. Uh, a whole lot of experimentation with uh, things like Echolink and emerging internet technologies with amateur radio. And uh, there's some controversy that comes with those changes as well. And um, 
being a musician, you know, I'm fond of David Byrne from the Talking Heads who said, same as it ever was. <laughs> because there's always going to be, there's always going to be the element of change involved with amateur radio. That's what we do. The technology is constantly evolving and we're learning new ways to incorporate that technology into what we do, whether it's recreation, public service, it doesn't matter. There's always going to be some new piece of technology that we can embrace and bring into the hobby. Uh, you know, there's a very well and uh, tried phrase, I'm a no-code ham, you know? <laughs> well, I'm a no-code ham used to mean that you were extremely proficient at CW. Well, now I'm a no-code ham means, you know, Linux. So, remember that uh, there are a whole lot of no-coders, K-N-O-W, no-coders out there uh, that are doing something other than CW. Dayton Hamvention. 30,000 people last weekend showed up. Largest amateur radio convention in North America. I think I got a cold there. Not everything you find in the flea market is great. <laughs> that same weekend, while 30,000 amateur radio operators were enjoying talking about the hobby. Out in San Mateo, California was the Bay Area Maker Fair. They drew 150,000 people. These are all high-tech projects involving computers, electronics, kit building, all kinds of things. And they're drawing a whole lot of young people. And there are a lot of young people that are really, really interested in what is going on in the maker community. Um, they're just like us. People who are enjoying building electronics in the maker community are just as curious about how all of this stuff works as we are. They have that inherent bug, you know, they want to learn how stuff works. They want to know how it, how it works. These are our people. We need to reach out to them. I'm a musician. I love jazz. I love jazz history. Um, in the 1930s, jazz music accounted for about 70% of all profits made in the music industry. By 1970, it only added up to about 3%. What happened? Technology. You're right. You're right, Jeff. Rock and roll. All the older folks had this new thing called television. They could stay home and be entertained for a lot less money than going out to the club. It was a lot uh, more convenient to stay at home and enjoy this new technology. And all of the young musicians who would normally be playing jazz had heard the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. They didn't want to play jazz anymore. They wanted to play rock and roll. Technology hurt music. It hurt jazz. So what happened to jazz? It almost died. You know, there were a handful of musicians that were staying to the old traditions, you know, horn players like Sonny Rollins, Stan Getz, people like that. If you're if you're a jazz music if you're a jazz fan, you know those names. But there was a lot of innovation and there was a lot of hybridization that was going on. And a lot of bands in the early to mid-70s that were interested in rock and roll started incorporating some of the elements of jazz. And a lot of jazz musicians, who couldn't find work at that point in time, found work backing up some of these rock and roll bands that were willing to try new stuff. There came a new music out of that called fusion. And eventually, as rock and roll blossomed and evolved and reinvented itself throughout the 70s and early 80s, traditional jazz music found a renaissance, and it came back. So, you know, I think that amateur radio can learn something from the history of the evolution and advancement of jazz music. Uh, 2,500 years ago, Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu said, if you do not change direction, you will wind up where you are going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ARRL's mission is to advance the art, science, and enjoyment of amateur radio. And in order to fulfill that mission, we have to reach out to today's tech-minded people. And that means communicating with them 
through their own channels of communication. Social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. It's important. If we're going to reach new amateurs, we have to use the language that they use, and we have to use the channels of communication that they use. 2013, I had just become public relations director for the league and was invited to the Rocky Mountain Division Convention in Estes Park. I was all set to give a nice talk about the fun and excitement that you can have on uh, taking six-meter gear and going on grid expeditions, which is still really cool. I had six people at my forum. They were all veteran six-meter operators. My forum time was an hour, and we were done in about 20 minutes. So I'm done. I'm wandering the halls. And there's a whole crowd spilling out of another forum room. And it was Ed James introducing everybody to something called Raspberry Pi. I'd never heard of Raspberry Pi. But there were a whole lot more people in that forum than in my forum. It was so popular they had to do it again. And it was standing room only a second time. I knew I was out of touch. I don't like being out of touch. So that's when I learned that I needed to start checking out what was going on because amateur radio was evolving again. It wasn't all HF contesting and DXing anymore. Whole lot of things going on out there and I didn't know what it was. I didn't like that. So, here we are with this change. What do we do with it? We embrace it. That's what we do with it. It's all out there. Glenn Popeil, KW5GP, just released his second book for the ARRL on Arduino projects for amateur radio. It's got a microcontroller uh, project in there that looks pretty neat. It's a self-contained JT65 transceiver built around an $11 Chinese CW transmitter. It's a 3x3 three three inch box. <coughs> it costs you about 60 bucks to build. That's cool. You've got folks like uh, Jerry Ellsworth. Does anybody here know that name? Jerry Ellsworth? Jerry Ellsworth is a self-taught engineer in Silicon Valley. And uh, she just went from zero to extra at Pacificon last year. She is a rock star in the maker community. She is currently working on projects that introduce old and new technologies that might be of interest to the amateur radio community and the maker community. Wouldn't that be nice? Has anybody here heard of a group called HamSci in the news lately? These are a bunch of graduate level students being backed by several major colleges and universities that are doing real-time propagation studies on the upcoming uh, eclipse in August. They want to see how that eclipse is going to affect propagation on 40 and 80 meters in the d of the ionosphere. That's just one project that they're working on. And they're asking all amateur radio operators to participate in this because they need real QSOs to be made to test the effects of the ionosphere during the eclipse. And they're gathering all this data. This is amateur radio being used for bona fide scientific research. And it's all being coordinated by a bunch of 20 and 30 year olds. These are just three of countless ways that amateur radio is truly evolving at this point. I love ham radio. You know, I've been interested in radio since I was three. It predates my interest in baseball. That's saying a lot. I like teaching others, you know, and lately that means showing off the amateur radio satellites, like Katie was mentioning earlier. You know, it's, it's, it's fun to be able to take, you know, three or four pounds of gear and be able to communicate with that from a hill or from a river or from a valley, taking amateur radio out of your house and bringing it to the outside. You know, that's enjoyable. Um, and I'm going to make mistakes as I start checking out all this new technology and playing with these new things that I'm 
interested in. You know, I'm glad that our Arduinos and Raspberry Pis are only around 40 bucks because I'm going to blow one up. <laughs> you know. Jerry Ellsworth has a video on her YouTube channel called, um, oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting the name of it. It's basically, it, it, the whole theme of the video is don't worry about failing. And she, she spends four or five minutes going through some of her most spectacular, epic fails while doing all of this incredible technology stuff. Um, so don't be afraid to fail, folks. You know, There's always going to be CW on 40 meters. There's always going to be a de-expedition that you're going to need to work for an all-time new one. That's not going away. But there is a whole lot of other stuff that's going on in the hobby right now by the next generation that's coming up. And we owe it to ourselves and the hobby to make sure that we know what it is and what's going on. Because it's cool. Just like the rest of amateur radio is. It's all cool. So my challenge to you tonight is to hold a summit in your club. If you have a maker group in your area, invite them in. See what kind of projects you can show them. See what kind of projects they can show you. Hold a summit, half day, a day. Introduce each other to the technologies that you're using. And then collaborate. Work on something together. Bring both groups in and build something together. You make relationships that way. You learn things that way. You teach that way. That's how this has always worked. <coughs> jazz drummer Art Blakey once said that jazz washes away the dust of everyday life. Okay? I think that learning does that too. And I think that if all of us take the time to reach out and learn of the new technologies that are going on in amateur radio, every single one of us will advance the art, science, and enjoyment of this hobby that we love so much. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming out. Um, Katie forgot to mention one thing. When she and I got married, we got married on sweepstakes weekend. We promptly said our vows, <coughs> packed up everything, and went to W1AW and contested in sweepstakes. Doesn't every married couple do that? <laughs> but while there, Sean and Ward took a break and serenaded us on our wedding night. <laughs> so he's into music. Um, anyway, it's my turn to turn this thing over to Jack. He's got a few awards to give out for the section. And unfortunately, i got to give Jack the microphone. <laughs> yeah, I, do you want the microphone, It's going to be short, so. That's what you said last time. Yeah, right. Are you long with it? reason or another, uh, the Wyoming section has not had a ham of the year since 2013. Yes, so I did a little research, Garth helped me out, and we went back and we found 20, uh, 2013 was the last one. So I put out the information asked for candidates or nominations, and we got some worthy candidates for all three years. So I'm going to give out tonight three hams of the year. I'm going to start out with 2014. I think I've got my numbers right. How many of you in 2014 participated in the Centennial Celebration? It was wonderful, outstanding. We did that in Wyoming. I again was in Arizona wintering, and I read in the uh, online that we were going to have a next, uh, some kind of something going on in Wyoming and across the country. And I contacted a gentleman in Wyoming to see what was going on. Am I too late to do this? 
No, you're not. Anyway, the person that organized all of the two week of the week sessions that we had, we had one in June and one in November, I believe. Set up the schedules, the different bands, everything. He is the 2014 Ham of the Year, and I'm very pleased to honor Walt Marshall, who did all of the groundwork for the Wyoming WLAW. I need to interject something in here. That job was actually entrusted to me, and I couldn't handle it, so I passed it off to Walt, and he did a wonderful job with it. Dwayne, thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> Speaking of 98 years, <laughs> ironically, I emailed with a wall to get my spot in this uh, in this this thing, and I was able to go to the centennial celebration in Hartford. First time I'd ever been to the W1AW, and I look and I'm not real sharp. I'm not an engineer like like he is, but I could do the math. I knew that I wouldn't be around for the next hundred years. <laughs> and we have family in, in New Jersey, so it was kind of neat. We went out to visit them, and I put it all together. And I was waiting to get on the bus to go to the holy grail of, of ham radio, W1AW, and there's an escalator, an escalator coming down from the upper part of that convention. And I see this gentleman coming down the escalator. I've never met him. And I just knew it was Walt. And I walked over and, and it was Walt. And, and now that, and he, you know, he's the one that set that up. So thank you for that. It's a wonderful celebration. I can't wait for 2018, whatever you guys got planned. Uh, 2015. Uh, this gentleman is a ham operator's ham, is what he is. He has his hands, his fingers, in anything that's related to ham radio, <coughs> whether it be e-com, whether it be emergency uh, preparedness or whatever. But he's had a few bumps along the way as a ham radio operator. One of them, uh, from what I understand, a little birdie told me, to, uh, I talked to a little birdie this afternoon, got some information on this gentleman. I had to do something to do with tires, flat tires or something. To, a mass of blowouts, uh, doing one thing or another, and he'll, he'll maybe if we get him up here, he can tell you the story. He's always there to help. Uh, he's uh, whatever it is in the community, and this the 2015 ham of the year is Garth Crow. Happy birthday, oh. Garth! It's been a wonderful day for you. set up the radio or whatever and blow out a cocker. <laughs> and somebody has to come help me. <laughs> Thank you very much. The 2016 Ham of the Year comes from the eastern part of the state and he has been named the Ham of the Year one other year. And that was when Wyoming, or we, we uh, hosted in Cheyenne the 20, help me out Mike Whitmore, 2011, wasn't it? Yeah. And this gentleman was named as the 2010 Ham of the Year. He is a lot like Garth. He's Mr. Everything in our community. He's a emergency coordinator. He's a Skywarn. He does everything under the sun. And uh, the, the, I don't know if anybody else, I don't know the history, has ever won the Ham of the Year twice or three times or whatever. But uh, and he's not here, and uh, I don't know if uh, James and Debbie are here. Are they here? They are not here. Uh, how about Marty McGuffey, our club president? Uh, Brian McNutt, N7BAM, is the 2016 Ham of the Year, and he's not here. But we'll make sure 
we get this thing. Why do you think that? I may need the mic later, so. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? Um, I gotta get my notes out because I can't remember anything anymore. Um, first off, I want to recognize, as already <coughs> been done, the, the Basin Ham Club. You guys did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. so, Hats off to the Bighorn Basin Club. That's one of the first things I know. <laughs> the next thing is that um, this division convention moves every year. And next year, Ed's going to take the ball and run with it down in New Mexico. So put it in your calendars to try and get there next year. They haven't set a date yet, but uh, it's probably going to be in August. Second August, second, second weekend in August. Second weekend in August. So uh, they have set a date. And plan to come down there. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about, Mel touched on it a little bit, is YMU. That's coming up. What's the date on that, Mel? 15 and 16, 16, 17, 18 of June. 16, 17, 18 of June. You're getting that damn close to field day, buddy. That's why they did it. Is that we're illiterate from Colorado, we don't know much of shit down there. What does that stand for? It stands for Wyoming, Idaho, Montana, and Utah. YMU. It's a four state. It's not affiliated with any one section. It's all four of them. We got together and said, let's have a good fun ham fest. And it's usually thrown together as fun. I've been to a couple of them uh, in the past. And they're not about... Uh, forums and so forth, they're about fun. Get together, shake hands, eat good food, and, and just BS the day away. It's really fun. Where's it going to be, Mel? Bear Lake. Where? Bear Lake. Bear Lake, Gardner City, and they have a convention facility there that they've made arrangements for. So it's going to be in Bear Lake in Utah. And, and that's right across the border from Jackson, isn't it? <laughs> You know. Um, okay, I've done all my pitches. It's time for me to introduce my right-hand man again, Jeff uh, K0RM. He is graciously taking the reins as vice director when I got uh, so ceremoniously uh, pushed up to the front table. And so Jeff gets to take over the, uh, the age-old tradition of the vice director giving away goodies. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, Dwayne. Much appreciated. Just got a couple of things to give away. A couple of goodies here. Uh, got a repeater director, brand new, hot off the press. And then I've got a couple of uh, license manuals. And uh, these are uh, donated by the ARRL. So we'll, uh, we'll start with the uh, ARRL's general Q&A upgrade to general class ham radio license. So I want to give this away to who is the newest technician class uh, licensee in the room? Do we have anybody that was got their technician license this month? How about in the past six months? Any technicians in the past six months? Any technicians in the past year? Okay, there's one right here. There's only one hand up. Two, two hands up. Yeah, I think you'd fall in that category. Yeah. Okay, so what, what month? I believe it was April. April? Oh, there's one over here? April last year. April of last year. April of 2016. Okay, is that the most? March, April. March. Okay, so April. Bueller. Or either you later than that? Bueller. July. Okay, so July is the winner. Congratulations. <laughs> Falls back to that math thing. We're looking for the newest, not the oldest. <laughs> All right, 
So this next is also, this is the general class license manual. So also somebody who needs to upgrade to general. So let's find the individual in the room who has had their technician license the longest. Because you are in serious need of an upgrade. <laughs> I, we got the book for you right here. So let's see, how are we going to start? Somebody who has been, uh, uh, who got their technician license more than 40 years ago? Right. Hold on. More than 30 years ago? There's got to be at least one technician in here. That's had your tech license for 30 years, all right, 20 years. Well, wait a minute. How many techs do we have in the room? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, so somebody's going to win this. <laughs> all right, so 2000, anybody before the year 2000? All right, I've got two hands right here, three hands, right? And that's it, three. Anybody before... 1995. Two hands, one went down. Anybody before 1990? There you go, right there. KB2BZY. <laughs> Congratulations. She just promised me she's going to upgrade, so. Let's... Yeah. All right. Brand new repeater directory. Let's see. Somebody needs a repeater directory. Who here has put an independent repeater on the air in the last six months? Brand new. Just put it on. Just put it on the air within the last six months. I don't want. Put it. your hand. In. <laughs> uh, how about in the last year? Somebody put a new repeater on the air in the last year? Come on, Wyoming. Um, how about in the last two years? All right, there's Ed James, got his hand up. Is that it? That's the new, you've got the newest repeater, has gone on the air in the Rocky Mountain Division. Where, where is it? Sandia Crest. Sandia Crest. All right, you're the winner. You got it. That's it for the giveaway, so we'll turn it back to our esteemed director, Mr. Dwayne Allen. <laughs> Don't run all the Don't run off. Okay, now comes the division awards. The way the division awards work is I call for nominations, usually via an email or a Facebook post or something of that nature. We take all of these nominations. Mix them in a hat and pull them out. No, um, what we do is we take each section manager. I want all my section managers to stand up, please. Okay. All four of these section managers are the drivers of the committee. They take one person that they want to be their assistant. So now we have eight members of the committee, and they judge these nominations. So I have absolutely nothing to do with it other than they're generated and I send them to these guys and they get it done. In the event that there's a tie, my vice director gets to choose who he wants. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it's never happened. So we've never had to call in a vice director to choose this. It's a it's pretty good independent way of doing things, I think. So we're going to start. We have three awards, by the way. They are the Technical Achievement Award. Young Ham of the Year, and Ham of the Year for the division. Our Technical Achievement Award winner is not here, so Jeff will be taking this down to Colorado. His name is also Jeff. Jeff developed an extensive network of linked repeaters for, that started at their life. All these repeaters started their lives as little independent, low-level sites, and he linked them all together. He also managed to get three of these repeaters on the same frequency tone pair so that as you as an operator riding through the area, you don't ever know that you've swapped repeaters. They have voting receivers on it. This is quite a, quite a feat. It's a, they use voting receivers to pick the strongest signal, and that repeater is the one that picks up and starts transmitting. So it's, it's pretty cool. Um, speaking of that, the repeater that I put in 
is also linked into that network. So from northeast Wyoming, you can get on a little 440 machine and talk to somebody in Denver, Colorado. It's just kind of cool. And Jeff designed all this stuff. So K0JSC Jeff, that's Juliet Sierra Charlie, Jeff Carrier is our Technical Achievement Award winner, and Jeff will make sure he gets that. Yeah. We did not <coughs> receive a Young Ham of the Year nomination. Um, this says a lot to what Sean was talking about. We have to get more young people involved. It's every person in the room responsibility to get young people tied up in this. Um, I'm failing. We're all failing. This is a mark where ham radio gets a failing grade, and I don't like it. <coughs> we need to get more young people involved. So I challenge each and every one of you to get someone under the age of 25 involved in our hobby. Please do this. Then we have our ham of the year. The Rocky Mountain Division ham of the year is a longtime active ham in northern Wyoming. He's heavily involved in clubs here in northern Wyoming. He's also an officer in the Bighorn Basin Club. He, uh, he, he does a lot of mentoring. He really likes to help people out, and that's probably the thing that kicked him over the top because there were a couple of other good nominations, but mentoring stood out. He's active in MCOM. He's an active VE. <clears throat> He's active in community service. Participates in field day, which makes him a well-rounded ham, and that's what you're looking for when you're looking for a ham of the year, somebody that's well-rounded. Gary White, AB7, VK nominated, and we accepted the nomination of Jerry Pyle, that would be 7S, my friend. only been used once radio <laughs> and uh, it is up for auction we have met the price so it's going to go uh, come by and look at it there is a sheet of paper somewhere here remember that all the proceeds above the price go to the Bighorn Basin Radio Club so um, it's not like I get to keep this or the league gets to keep it or Yezu gets to keep it it stays right here in the Big Horn Basin. So um, consider it and uh, have a good evening, guys. Jack, do you want the damn microphone again? <laughs> I'm bringing some cake to the anniversary couple, but there is plenty here. Please feel free to come on up and grab a piece. This is made by a friend of mine, Melanie Wilmer, who. Um, is in Kirk County. So we hold this all the way across the state because it is that good. So please do come up and try to I suppose you're here for something besides seeing a couple over the hill old men cry tonight. And uh, Anybody here for prizes? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about those prizes? Is that something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're going to do first, the first one we're going to do.
we're going to do is our pre-registration prize. We have two of those. And those are the yellow tickets, green tickets. Yeah, there. I got them all mixed up in that Red Bull red. All right, Red Bull. I'm not eligible for any of this. Nor am I. Those are the folks that pre-registered, either online or through the snail mail. And uh, we have to take bigger tickets. That was him. Yeah, he did that. I did the tickets. If you like the tickets, let me know. If you didn't, talk to Dwayne. He can go next time. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest uh, technician in the group will let her draw. Mix them up. Toss them out. Mix them up. Don't get the one take the bottom, it's Jackson. <laughs> if mine's in there, it's going back in. Okay. Get my glasses focused here. Mark Barringer. Wow. Yeah. Who's Mark? KS1 TL. He was right. He was the webmaster. From what I understand, this was his first attacking a ham radio related web page. And he grew up a lot with the rest of us, and it turned into a super, super page before it was over. Awesome. Very deserving. Very deserving. It's a nook. This came from Arizona, by the way. One more. How about Mom? Her name is actually in there. I don't care. Hey. You, you, she can draw a card. Oh, okay. Don't worry. <laughs> I say she can, she right, can. Bye, baby. <laughs> no, it's not mine. Okay. okay. <laughs> Darn it, do you want to try it again? <laughs> this prize gets to go all the way back to New Mexico. Art, N5 ART. Tickets. We were going to draw a couple. Of, we have those mixed up. And Mike, in case I didn't get back in time. So what now? Mike, Mike. come on, Mike. <laughs> you can twirl that around. But this is this is a, We uh, we had some extra prizes that came in. B twenty seven. B twenty seven. There you go. <laughs> This is my maiden voyage as one of these uh, organizers. We're not doing very well, so be patient. The big prizes are coming, and, and they're well, well worth the wait. Mike? No, it's going it's to say throw them up in the air. <laughs> whatever lands closest to that projector is the... No, that's the, way I was, that's the way it took me six years to get through four years of college, because my professors graded that way. Um, you may laugh, but Ed Hare, who has been to our division from the league, um, he actually drew the prize one year in Casper, and what he did was he grabbed the box, oh, yeah. and he threw all of them in the air, and the one that was left in the box was the winner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to screw them all and have another one. Yeah. 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 Close your eyes. If I win it, it's going back into the bucket. <laughs> Oh, my God. Uh, we're going to have to have a little... Uh, 
card back in for the grand prize, grand grand prizes. That, I, that may have been what we had in mind. I don't know. It's been a long. This has been a long week today. Would that work? Would that work for you? We have three things to give away, and, yeah. and we'll put the the, the green. Because I know what you're after. Yeah. Number four. Doug W Y seven D S. Doug here. Doug. There you go. Be eligible for the grand prize. Yeah. So we have uh, from Susan, is Susan, Susan here, or did they go back? Susan and Chris Smith, he was a presenter. Uh, Susan had, uh, she's an author, and she's written some wonderful books. I read one of them, and I'm just dying to read the next one. It's, I, it's, it's a kind of a combination of Native American, uh, British spies, Sahara Desert, uh, CIA. Bad guys, good but good, good guys. These were on the ladies' table in the hallway with all the baskets, and uh, she she had two two sets of those that were drawn for prizes, and she had two others for this. And they're wonderful books if you're into reader. I'm not a reader, uh, but they are pretty neat. Uh, we have two of these. Two okay, the to make this easy, since we're drawing out of this barrel and putting it back in, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw the grand prize and set it aside. And we'll just sit there so that we don't have to worry about throwing these things back in. If we draw the grand prize ticket out right now, we're not going to tell who it is. We're just going to set it aside. The but then they can't win. Yeah, yeah but then you can't, they can't win. win anything else. If they're winning the grand prize, do they really worry about winning I'm anything else? I'm just checking things out. I'm a teacher. <laughs> Anybody have an opposition to that? That's how they do it at the contest dinner. Yeah. 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 That's exactly how they do it. They draw it first and don't tell who it is. And that way they can keep drawing Take us out of the barrel without having to put them back in. All right. And, and if you win, obviously the ticket doesn't go back in for anything. Right. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, one more set of books. You may have a winner on the book. 